How many of you are familiar with the word dross, D-R-O-S-S? Have you ever heard of that? Maybe you heard the expression, count it all to dross. Anybody? Go ahead, show me your hands. This is going to be a completely new word. Kaylee has heard it. All right, good. Well, that's, that's fine. We'll, we'll learn about a new word today. It's used in the Bible several times, and it has to do with the process of smelting and molding metal, purifying metal. We are supposed to be a purified people. We don't just come to the Lord and stay the way that we are. We can come any way that we are. Absolutely. Full of sin, full of iniquity, full of imperfections, we come to the Lord. His Spirit draws us and we come to Him. And then the process begins. Many people make the mistake of thinking, I can't come to God right now. I can't do the thing that God is calling me to do right now because I'm just not worthy. I'm just not ready. I, I've, I've got too many uh, pieces of of junk in my life. I've got too many, um, too many bad habits. I've got too many sin things going on in my life. I've, I'm involved in too many things that I shouldn't be involved in. And so many times we'll see people who God is clearly calling them. He's got a call on their life to serve him, to be his child, to be his dedicated servant. He wants to sanctify them and set them apart, but they think, I'm not ready. I'm not worthy. So they, they delay coming to the Lord. But here's the truth. We come to the Lord just as we are, just as we are. When you came to the Lord, if you know Jesus as your Savior, whether you think you are good and righteous or not, your righteousness was as filthy rags. And mine was too. I was a dirty, slimy sinner when I came to the Lord at eight years old because I was born into sin, as we all were, were thanks to the, the sin nature that is inherited at birth from our grandfather, Adam. Amen? So we don't wait until we're perfect, until we're clean to come to the Lord. We come to the Lord and then he begins the process of cleaning us up. He begins the process of justifying us and sanctifying us and, and making us set apart. And we're talking about sanctification. Yes, I believe that it's an instantaneous experience as well as an ongoing lifelong journey that we walk out. A, a lifetime of being separated. That's what, that's one of the actual definitions of sanctification. To be separated, to be set apart. Um, you ever wonder as a believer why maybe you don't fit in, in in certain circles? Maybe you don't fit in on your job or at school. Maybe you don't fit in with a lot of your family, and maybe you don't even fit in with your church, depending on your church. But it could very well be because of that sanctification factor in your life. Because you are not only being made clean, but you are separated. You are set apart for the divine purposes of God. So we could start right now, if we're not already, we could start right now to to envision ourselves to think of ourselves as vessels or as as instruments that the Lord has set apart for his use but maybe there are a few things that are part of us that prevent us from being used to the uttermost used exactly like God wants us to be used and what am I talking about when I say used well I'm just talking about anything from starting an evangelistic organization and, and going around the world and ministering to being a godly example to your family. One of those is not any greater than the other. Did you know that? If you're doing what God has called you to do, then, then you're doing what God has called you to do. And we're gonna, not going to say, God, what you called me to do was, was too great, or God, what you called me to do was, was not big enough, and, and it doesn't compare to what you called someone else to do. But that's just not the case. God doesn't expect for us to accomplish incredible earth-shattering things. He already did that. He came and split time in half, B.C. and A.D., in the form of Jesus Christ, his son. He's already shaken the earth at Calvary, if you recall. So that's not what God expects us to do. He just expects us to be obedient and walk in wholeness, walk in, in holiness and sanctification. Do you agree? Isn't that amazing, though, that we get the grace and the goodness of God and we don't have to come to him perfect? We don't have to be perfect, but he wants to make us perfect. So these imperfections, if you take, if you take a piece of metal, a piece of gold, or especially, um, I like to use silver as the example, you can take the silver ore from the belly of the earth, from within the caves or the mines, and you get this nice piece of rock. But if you melt that down and then you pour it into a mold to make, say, a sword out of it or, or a vessel of some kind, some sort of instrument, it's not going to be as strong and not going to be as pretty as it should be because it is not pure silver. There is a lot of silver there, but there is something else called dross. Anything other than the silver, in fact, is called dross. 
You may have heard the expression, count it all to dross, when someone loses someone or something. Well, we just need to learn to count it all to dross, those things that didn't need to be there in order for us to be what God has called us to be. They may be bad things, they may be sin things, but then again, they may just be things that are there that are superfluous, that we don't need to have there. It might not be sin at all, but just things that we just need to have skimmed off the top. You see, when they melt the silver ore down, or gold ore, or whatever kind of ore they might have chosen, it goes into its liquid state. And then as they continue heating and heating, all of the dross, all of the impurities rise to the top. How convenient. They're brought to the surface. They are revealed. They don't stay within. They don't go to the bottom. They are lighter than the melted silver, so they float to the top. And then the refiner is able to skim them off little by little. And he continues after skimming and he continues heating. And, and just when you might think that everything is pure and everything is completely as it should be, something else can rise to the top. So you have to be, as a refiner, you have to be absolutely sure that everything has been removed. He skims them off the top, those are discarded, and then what he's left with is pure, refined silver. Like silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times, the words of the Lord are pure words. Do you know that scripture? The words of the Lord are pure. Let me say it for you again. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified how many times? Seven times. Seven is the number of completeness in the scripture, isn't it? The number of, of completion. We are in a heating process. We are in a process of being skimmed. The impurities, the things, both good and, and bad, you might even say, some things good, but things that we just don't need in our lives, again, are being refined away from us. They're being skimmed. The dross in our lives is being taken away. The place after the refining takes place that the silver goes to is called the foundry. Today's sermon, in fact, is entitled, Welcome to the Foundry. Did you know that you're in a foundry this morning? I actually thought that um, if, if we were to ever plant a church, that would be a great name for it. Call it the foundry, a place where instruments of purity are made. Today we're talking about being in that foundry because the foundry is not so much the place where the dross is skimmed off, but the foundry is the place where the silver goes after the dross has been skimmed off. And then it, just as you see in the picture, it is poured into molds in order to be used. It's his fire that is refining us. And we are being purified and made whole as we allow the Lord to make us whole. A foundry is defined as a workshop or factory for casting metal. Before it can be used, it has to be purified, and then it has to be cast. And then once it cools off, it can be used. In the scripture, Proverbs chapter 25, verses 4 and 5, I'm going to read that for you. It says this, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth the material for a vessel for the silversmith to work up. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness, moral and spiritual rectitude in every area and relation. We can take that in our lives, and it can help us to understand as we let it sink into our hearts that as the wickedness is removed from our lives, we become instruments that can go before the king. As the non-followers, as the non-believers, as those things, those people that are impure, are removed from the kingdom in the area of the kingdom, removed from the court of the Lord, a throne is established. Does that make sense? That's a pretty deep metaphor, isn't it? The throne for the Lord is established, a throne of righteousness. Romans chapter 10, verse 12. So then... Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. Most of us know that scripture, don't we? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. And then Acts chapter 10, verse 44 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message, confirming God's acceptance of the Gentiles. So let me take a, a short caveat here. Peter has received a vision that he is to go not to a group of Jewish people, but go to a group of Gentiles. Now the Gentiles were, well, they were like most of us, unless there are any people of Jewish descent here that I'm not aware of. They were not his original chosen people. 
So when Peter receives a vision from the Lord to go to a group of Gentiles at the home of a man named Cornelius, it's rather confusing. It's very, very odd. Now, what Peter didn't know at that time was that God had also given Cornelius, imagine God talking to someone who was outside of his little spiritual social group. Crazy, right? So God has also given a vision to Cornelius that Peter would come and preach at his home. So God is giving the vision to Peter that Peter's going, and God is giving the vision to Cornelius that Peter is coming. So isn't that just like God to work all things together for the good of those love who love him and are called according to his purpose? Amen? He is not quite understanding. In fact, God gives him uh, in that vision... Peter sees something that looks like a, a sheet. I picture it as a picnic blanket. And it comes down in front of him, and it's filled with all kinds of animals and creepy crawly things. And we're not just talking the, the kosher things. We're not just talking about the things that Peter is used to eating. We're talking like snakes and, you know, kangaroos and, and uh, you know, just all sorts of things that he would, I'm, I'm just guessing at what animals might have been there, but things that are not um, permitted for them to be eaten. There might have been some catfish and some shrimp and some some pork in there, maybe a pig or two. And um, the Lord tells Peter, take it and eat it. And Peter's like, no, Lord, I, I don't think so. I don't think so, for I have never eaten anything that is that is unclean or common. And so the Lord shows him the same thing again and says the same thing, take and eat. And Peter responds again, Lord, I've never, my righteous Jewish lips have never eaten anything that is not permitted to eat, anything that is unclean or common. And the Lord gives it to him a third time. The Lord's letting him know, do not call unclean that which I have made clean. Now, where most of the church over the years has taken this scripture is that it's okay to eat things that are unclean. It's okay to eat pork and shellfish and catfish. That is not at all what the scripture is telling us. That is not the point. Now, I am not telling you that it's wrong to eat those things. So that's not where I'm going either. But I'm simply in context letting you know that that is not at all what this scripture is telling us. Um, that is not the point. What he is doing is telling Peter that he's going to be going to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile. And he's going to be preaching the word to a group of Gentiles. And they are not unclean because even though they are not Jewish, even though they are uncircumcised, the Lord has made them clean. The Lord has made them clean. So again, we know from Romans that, that faith, how many of you know that it takes faith to be saved? You cannot be saved without faith, right? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word, or through the preaching, through the telling of the truth, through the telling of the gospel, through the telling about Jesus. We know that Jesus is the word, right? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh, and the word was God, and the word was, was with God. That's out of order. But, and the word came and dwelt among us. Jesus is the word of God. The word is Jesus. It was made flesh. It lived among us. It died on the cross for our sins. So, now let me say it again. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word. It was the word that Peter went to Cornelius' house to preach. He preached the truth. He preached the message of the word of Jesus. He preached the gospel. Gospel meaning the good news. It's not just a genre of music. Gospel means the good news. So Peter preached it to the people at Cornelius' house. It doesn't say that Peter had to go around shaking them back and forth, and then they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, does it? It doesn't say that they had to have just the right kind of music playing, and then they, they, it doesn't say that they had to have a Acme smoke machine to fill the place with we know that the Holy Spirit fell, and all it says that Peter did, it tells us that he went, he obeyed, but it tells us while Peter was still speaking these words, he wasn't even done preaching. Can you imagine? They interrupted his sermon. Let me go ahead and tell y'all, if anybody, all joking aside, all seriousness here, if anybody needs to be filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning, with the power, if you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost today, you don't have to wait till I'm finished preaching. Y'all hear me today? You don't, if you need to be, 
If you need to have a refilling, you don't have to wait. While I am still, and I'm not comparing myself to Peter by any means, but while I am still speaking today, go ahead and receive what God is trying to give you. It was so simple. There wasn't even in this case any waiting and tarrying in, in the upper room with all the believers. Now, the Gentile group may have been waiting and getting in one mind and one accord. We don't know for sure, but they didn't even experience the laying on of hands. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit while he was still speaking. And then the Amplified says, which confirmed God's acceptance of the Gentiles. Aren't you glad that God accepted us dirty, heathenous, uncircumcised Gentiles into the kingdom? I'm so glad that we are grafted into the vine of Abraham with all the promises and all the blessings and, and I dare say many of the responsibilities that came from the original covenant that God made with him. The first place that our minds tend to go, I think, when someone mentions, mentions dross or impurities being refined out of our lives is, is addiction, sin, unholiness, those secret things that we don't want anyone to know about. And definitely those need to come out. Those need to, those need to be refined and removed and skimmed off the top so that we can be pure, so that we can be holy. But, I want to tell you that there's something else that we might not immediately think of, several things, and the one that I want to focus on today is, is the dross of doubt. Now, if we don't accept the Scripture as God's holy word, then we don't have any common basis with which to talk about what Jesus did for us. Can I prove to you this morning that the Bible is the inerrant word of God? Can I prove that to you this morning? No, I can't. I can't because no matter what I throw at you, all of my beliefs and all the documentation, all you have to do is get on Google and you can find a hundred reasons why I'm wrong or a hundred reasons why it seems that I'm wrong. Do I believe it? Yes, 100%. Can I prove to you that God created the universe? Can I prove to you that we didn't all evolve from a puddle of goo or from monkeys or whatever the trend of the, of the decade is? Can I prove that to you either way? No, I really can't. And no one can truly prove it. They can come up with a whole system of apologetics, let's put it that way. And they can come up with a lot of facts and, and a lot of data and a lot of theory. But can they prove it to you? No, not completely, not emphatically. And neither can the other side, by the way. Either way, it takes faith. Now, for me, it would take a whole lot more faith to believe that I came from a monkey than it does to believe that I came from a creator with a divine plan. So, you see, however you go, it takes faith. People struggle very often with believing. Those with extremely scientific minds, sometimes the higher the IQ, the more people tend to struggle with it. Y'all, it doesn't matter tomorrow what kind of supposed documentation they find, what kind of evidence. If they fa find tomorrow a grave in the Holy Land and they dig it up and they find a body in there and it, the gravestone says Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, and they do DNA testing and they say, we can prove that it is, I don't know where they would get the DNA comparison, but anyway, if, if they did, and they say, we can prove that this is Jesus' body, y'all, it makes no difference. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't care what science says or what they think they can prove. What is that? Stupidity? No. <laughs> Denial? No. It is faith. I don't need to go to a museum and see Samson's hairbrush to know that he had great strength when the power of the Lord came upon him and he lost it when he disobeyed and had his hair cut. You know what I'm saying? It's just about faith. So this system of doubt that gets deeply rooted in our hearts and in our lives needs to go. That is dross that needs to be skimmed off the top and removed. Here's some of the problems that it causes when we have, when we have the dross of doubt in our lives. We start to doubt that God is real. We start to believe in the secular system that we evolved from nothing and from, from chaos came order. We need to be able to let that, that doubt be taken from our minds. Let it be skimmed off the top. We doubt too often today the power, the miraculous power of our God. Now I'm talking to the church. I'm talking to believers. Do you know that in the scripture, Jesus and the disciples 
they went about doing good. And it says that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Now later in scripture, Jesus tells the disciples, even greater things than these you will do. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to them and those they would make disciples on down to us. Greater things will we do than even he did. So if the sick were healed in the scripture, we can still heal the sick today through the power of Jesus. But we begin to doubt that and we think, well, this particular ministry, this guy on television seems to understand. He seems to have a special gift for healing the sick. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe he does have a special revelation. Um, and then um, maybe something happens in, in that ministry. and We see how, well, he wasn't the man of God and that he, he looks like he was. And we start to we start to doubt. But y'all, we cannot keep our eyes on the waves. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and stay walking on the water. Amen. Because the power does not come from the television evangelist who, who's doing well or the ones who failed. The power does not come from, from the preacher who, you know, you're so fond of or someone who claims to have a healing ministry, whether they do or don't. The power still comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The power still comes through the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word. It comes by the word. We have to stand strong and stand tall on the book on the promises, on the foundation of Jesus. The doubt that God still heals often causes us to not even what? Not even ask for healing, uh, let alone believe for healing. But God still does it today. Y'all, he's healed my body in the past. He has healed me so many times. Some of you know about supernatural healing because you've experienced it or you've seen uh, or had a family member who's experienced it. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to gonna praise the Lord. The dross of doubt. And, and doubt is a natural tendency. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's not a sanctified tendency necessarily, but it is a natural human tendency. I mean, let's be honest. Don't we all have doubts about this or that from time to time? Don't we all sometimes wonder, well, why didn't I get my healing? Why didn't my loved one get their healing? Why, why didn't my children get to experience the relationship with God that this other people, these other people's kids got to experience? Did I do something wrong? Maybe I wasn't really, really the, the Christian that I thought that I was, that I thought, thought that I was. When they were growing up. Just throwing out some strange examples there. But you know what? It's, it comes down to just believing. We need to be able to believe. If we don't believe, we're not going to ask. And the scripture lets us know that we have not because we ask not, doesn't it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word. Once again, we have to stand tall on the word. You think that I don't have doubts just because I stand before you today wearing this uncharacteristic uh, blazer? I, I have doubts still. I have doubts. Do I doubt that God is, is, is real? No, I don't doubt that. Do I doubt that Jesus came and gave his life for me and rose from the grave and ascended to his father and is now at his right side? No, I don't doubt that. But does the enemy try to place doubts in my mind about anything and everything, all of the above? Absolutely. The doubts are part of our life and they need to be ever skimmed off. People are doubting today. Look, young and old, this is one of those things that gets preached to young people, but whether you're young or you're old, this, this absolutely can apply to you. They doubt their worthiness. They may think, you know, I have not lived up to the expectations that my parents had for me. I have not lived up to the expectations that my church had for me. I grew up in church. I was in church every Sunday. I, I was a good kid. And then life happened, and, and I found out that there was more to life than just going to church. And there were other things in life than, than just hanging out with, you know, God's people and I've made so many mistakes. Maybe you felt that way before. Maybe your children have felt that way before. Hey, maybe your parents have felt that way before. And now, y'all, I'm just not worthy. I'm just not worthy to come. All that is is doubt. All that is is the enemy using your emotions against you. Whosoever... It doesn't matter what your past, it doesn't matter what your lifestyle, it doesn't matter what kind of illicit relationship you're in or have been in, it doesn't matter who you were with, when you were with them, it doesn't matter what you stole, it doesn't matter how little you gave, it doesn't matter whether your background is in Sunday school or in the jailhouse, Jesus died to give his life for you. There's a movement that says whosoever, and you would think, well, that's a good movement. But the part that they're missing is that they come to Christ 
And then the purification begins. Then the dross is to be skimmed off. You see, you don't come to Christ and stay the way that you are. That's the problem. People seem to think that, well, you know, God could never love me because I have this tendency or I have this, this bad habit or, you know, I'm attracted to this person or that person. That's baloney. God still loves you and you are still invited to come into the kingdom of God. When you get to the kingdom, though, you're not going to be the way that you, that you came. You're going to begin the process, some of it instantaneously and some of it's a lifelong process of being changed of being purified, the refiner's fire working in your life and working on your spirit. Amen? And my testimony always seems kind of limited because I was able to avoid all of those crazy years because I got saved when I was about eight years old at youth camp, and and I've been living for the Lord ever since. And that's not that's not bragging. And sometimes uh, it's just saying I'm blessed. That was a blessing, you know? Um, Sometimes I feel like uh, well, I don't have a very interesting testimony. I wasn't out in, you know, prodigal son and, and eating pig pen food and, you know, trying to find my way back to my father's house. So I don't have that testimony. And maybe some of you do. And praise God that you have that testimony that he brought you through. But y'all, I cannot let myself doubt the worthiness of my testimony because I was blessed to be saved at an early age. Any more than you or whoever this applies to can doubt the effectiveness of your testimony Because your testimony is, well, that's the word, isn't it? Your testimony is what this word has done in your life. What Jesus, the word made flesh, has done in your life. There's a scripture somewhere, you may have heard it recently, This is faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word. We are made overcomers, in fact, by the words of our testimony. So stand up and testify loud and long and clear. Let the church know, let the world know what Jesus has done in your life and let them know what he wants to do in their life. In the name of Jesus, let them know that he wants to make a difference. You got children who aren't doing what you know that God wants them to do. Be a testimony to them. Faith comes by hearing. You got parents who aren't doing what you know the Lord wants them to do, aren't living like they need to be living. Your your neighbors, your spouse, let them know what God is doing in your life. Put the scripture in front of them. I often pray, God, establish your presence all around them, in front of them, beside them, behind them, up and above and below, so that whatever direction they go in, they can't help but bump into you. They can't help but bump into your Holy Spirit. Church, there is coming a time, and that time has come. It is now when we've got to stand stronger and bolder than we ever have before, more filled with the Holy Spirit, more baptized in the Holy Ghost, with the evidence not only of tongues, which is absolutely an evidence, but not just the evidence of tongues, but the evidence of all the fruit of the Spirit and all the gifts of the Spirit, because we are the only testimony that some people will ever have in their lives. This word, and I use my iPad, but it's got the Bible pulled up, so pretend that it's a Bible. This Bible may never be read by the person in your office or by your your kid, your grandchild. It might not never be read at, at this point in their lives. So you have to live it out. And you have to remind yourself that this doubt that I can't be effective, this doubt that I'm, you know, I don't wear a suit and stand behind a, behind a pulpit. I don't hold a microphone and I, and I don't have a television ministry. So who am I to try to, to tell anyone, even my own, my own household about Jesus. Who are you? You're a born-again, blood-washed, spirit-filled child of the Most High God is who you are. That's who you are, so you have as much authority as anyone else. You Gentile, you. Have you heard the word? Yeah, you have. You've heard the word. If only today you've heard the word. And while Peter was still speaking, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Y'all, while you're still speaking, the Lord can make a complete turnaround in your home and in your life. This dross of doubt that tries to to send us in the wrong direction, that tries to get us into places that we never had any business going. There's the doubt that your children are going to be okay. Have you ever experienced that? The doubt that your children are ever going to come back into the fold. Stop doubting and start preaching. Don't worry about what words you're using as long as you're using the words of Scripture. Live the life before them. Speak the... I just want to speak the name of Jesus. 
I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every doubt and every dark desire and over every addiction. I speak the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over the doorposts in my home. Do you ever do that? We have doubt that we can approach God. Well, I mean, after all, even living for God all these years, we're still not worthy to approach the throne of God, are we? We're truly not. Once again, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And here's the good thing, though. We live post-Calvary. We live after the cross of Calvary. We live after Jesus was crucified. We live after the veil. And you know about this veil? Y'all know about this giant veil that was in the temple, right? That separated mankind Everyone except for the high priest and only on allotted days when he was made particularly clean, cleansed. It separated mankind from the Shekinah presence of God. But when Jesus died, when he gave his life, the blood was shed. That veil that separated mankind from God was rent in twain. It, it split right down the middle. And I, I saw a picture of it the other day, and I used to picture it as being about this tall, like a doorway, kind of a, a little piece of fabric that was there, and you could maybe kind of see through it. It was a bit, but that wasn't what, it was, it was huge. It was tall. It was thick, very thick, and it split in two, not just representative of God and man being reconciled, but literally Jesus reconciled man so that we can all boldly approach the throne. And no, truthfully, we're still not worthy with all the refining. We're not worthy. But when God sees us, he doesn't see our unworthiness. He sees the blood of Jesus. So once again, we plead the blood of Jesus over our lives. And we speak the name of Jesus over our families. And we establish an atmosphere of the word all around them. But we have doubts still. It needs to be removed. It needs to be refined. Doubt that our children...